So, yes, we will meet the happy product owner families today. And let's see what kind of cards do you have on your hands? A little bit about me. So um, I'm working as an agile leadership consultant, trainer, speaker uh, at TaskMill. And pretty much on me are the trainings at TaskMill. We have done a really great selection of, of good agile trainings for you. And of course, I'm the crazy cat lady. I'm still alone here, but let's see for how long, because when I start speaking, my cat thinks I'm speaking to her. Who else would I speak to? So she'll probably show up soon. Couple words about TaskMill, because we're not the most uh, well-known Finnish company like Walt yet, uh, but we are solely uh, concentrating on agile uh, things. So we help uh, organizations um with the agile transformation and if you're missing a product owner or a scrum master or agile coach or, or something like that we have the right persons for you to help out and we also do facilitation and remote facilitation sometimes it's good to get someone from the outside to help in a tricky situation and my my beloved training and coaching section here um so I'm sure you all have played these uh, happy families or hullunkuriset perheet, like we call them in Finnish. Today we have the PO edition of them. And yes, um, PO is really the crucial role if you want to be building the right product for the right uh, place and really building a valuable product. But sometimes uh, we tend to nominate POs who maybe are not ready for the job. And those are the families we look at today. So sometimes uh, out of the PO, we also all, only get some sort of mumbo jumbo. The families I'm going to be presenting very shortly, they unfortunately are all coming from real life. So they are, the stories are based on real people. And first, of course, we have the always first family. Everybody has met these ones, I'm sure, because they are always like, oh, yes, that's the first priority. And what about this one? Oh, that's the first priority as well. We, we really need to get all this done. So that is the first priority and that is the first priority. So they can't really make up their mind what should be built next. What is the thing that the team should really be focusing on? which tends to lead the huge uh, work in progress. So team tries to solve a lot of things at the same time, and we all know what happens with that. Nothing gets out. So it just team is trying to do too many things at the same time, and the end result is zero. Uh, if there is a product, it's a little bit of a question mark out of this PO, uh, if it's going to be a smart one or not. How should you fix this kind of situation when you run into this always first family? Um, you need to make sure that they clarify what is it that we're building here? What is the vision? What is the mission that we're on? Uh, what is the roadmap? In which order should we be building these things? And the prioritization technique needs to be taken into use so that we really understand the uh, reasoning why we're doing this first. Why is this more valuable than, than something that we'll do, do later? And for this family, for instance, this kind of user story mapping technique might be a really good one. To see the forest from the trees. Really start from the user point of view, thinking what kind of activities do they need, and then start slicing them into stories and prioritizing the stories. What is really the mandatory thing to do? So that might be a, a good one to introduce this, to this family. The next family is the watchdog family. They are like, uh, uh, you went there, quarter to four yesterday. I saw you were offline. Where were you? Why do you have two more hours on the, on the time report than, than in Jira in this issue? Why is this issue not done yet? It's been idle for two days, so it's been in progress forever, and, and it's a small task. So, unfortunately, they are putting their focus into the wrong place. And how does this impact the team? Well, it just kills the creativity of the team and the self-management in the team. Uh, they just start working on what the PO yells them to do. 
and of course it's not very motivating for the people and at least the a team will definitely start looking for somewhere else to to work with so how do you fix this kind of issues it's probably some sort of coaching or mentoring that could help here you need to turn the po's focus from the people uh, to the product and not delivering hours or story points but really delivering value and measuring that it's really the right thing to do and often i think that the root cause here is that the metrics are somewhat awkward in the in these places so fix the metrics measure the right thing don't measure hours it's um, if you measure hours you'll get hours you can't sell them The next one we have is the committee family. You know, two some is great and three some is even greater. So nice to be a group, a real committee working together. And I've even even heard of five some. Uh, what does this do to the team? The confusion comes in. So I have this problem. Who should I talk to? I have like five people here who are the POs. So. Who is responsible of this area? Uh, 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 it's slowing the decision making because it's a committee making the decisions and not just one person. And it typically tends to lead to content switching as well, since uh, team seems to focus more on the issues where the PO is actually present. And when the PO leaves, the other one comes, they jump into the next thing. And as we all know, content switching slowing just things down slow decision making not very good with agile teams confused team no not very good things happening here what i usually recommend to do in a situation like this is that you actually choose who of the two or three or five is actually the product owner and the rest could be the subject matter experts which they are uh, typically, this situation is because we're building something quite big and uh, it's, uh, it's not possible for one person to uh, have the deep knowledge over the whole big thing. Um, I think that's okay. That's why we have the subject matter experts. But uh, as long as there is one who is like prioritizing the work, keeping the team updated and so that the team understands where they need to focus right now. Um, next, we have the rubber stamp family. You know, the people whose morning routine, including going in front of the mirror, taking a deep smile, and like, yes, CEO, we'll do it. Yes. Yes, of course, we'll do it. Yes, we can do it. Yes. So these are the people who, who just take everything from the hippos and the squeaky wheels and all this bad ways of prioritizing things and and there's no real vision and no real understanding of what is the product going to be what is the value that we're going to be delivering and the end result out of this it's not going to be a product it's a pile of features without a rhyme or reason how do you fix it i would start with the training because uh, apparently this po doesn't really understand their role that well and their responsibilities that well. So a training would be a good first spot. Maybe some coaching also, so that they can uh, learn to say no to some things. Maybe uh, collaborate better to the stakeholders, taking them all into one prioritization uh, session where we talk about and show what kind of things we have, what is the roadmap, what is the mission, vision here, and uh, and really starting working together and crystallizing what what is it that we are supposed to get done the next family is the busy bees and so sorry there's no picture because we couldn't stop them for five minutes uh they are so busy all the time they don't really have uh, time to sit with the teams it's um it's typically people who just love to gather hats a lot of hats a lot of roles uh, and the measure of success is how full their calendar is. Uh, it's not a very good thing for a PO because it leaves the team on their own. 
they need to make the decisions. They need, they need to figure out what should they build next or what should they do? What is the product going to be? And if this PO doesn't even have the know-how because they have all these roles and, and maybe they're something else just got the hat to be a PO. So this is going to be a disaster. You won't get anything done and not anything smart anyway. How to fix it? A team does deserve a good PO. Someone who is uh, available when the team needs so that they get the answers. So would it be possible if this person still wants to be the big PO then to uh, like produce the other load, uh, delegate some other tasks or other hats to some other people? Um, could someone from the team maybe become a PO? Maybe there is someone who is more knowledgeable who could take the task, start talking to the customers, to the stakeholders. Um, oftentimes, I think the, the root cause here behind these busy bees is also that the organization is not really understanding what Agile is. So they're just going there because it's a trend. And these people, um, what I've seen, they're typically like, uh, yeah, good thing. Agile is a good thing. Change is a good thing. You change. As long as I don't have to do anything, it's a really good thing. So we really need to coach people understanding what does it mean in your role if we're doing things in an agile manner. <coughs> Sorry, it's still a bit flu. That's why I'm at home and not at Tampere. I was supposed to. Uh, next, we have the Besserwisse family. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. I don't speak German. Um, this is the, the guys who who is like, I don't need to talk to the customer because I have been the customer for 30 years, 10 years ago. I am the product owner. I'm the, I'm the one calling the shots. Um, what they get out of it, um, it might be a good pro uh, product for markets 10 years back, but maybe not for today. So what we need to do, we need to get them in the touch with the customer for sure uh, they need to know what the customers need today what is it that they will need tomorrow um, maybe go to a fair uh, do some market research get to know your competition understand what they are doing uh, what kind of problems they are solving for the customers and what really are the problems of the customer of today and in the near future um, I think oftentimes behind these best services, there's also the thing that they don't really know how to contact the customer or who should they contact, uh, or maybe they don't just uh, want to disturb the customer. I think that's quite not so valid here. I think when you go to the customers and ask them, they feel important because they've been asked their opinions and their problems. And usually they are just happy to share it because if you listen to them, if you can help the, with them problems, uh, it's going to really help the customers. Next, we have the Flintstone family. For them, it's essential that in the beginning we fix the budget, the content, the schedule. Almost like waterfall, eh? Maybe. And you need to get the estimates from the development teams, of course, so that you can emphasize that these are the estimates from the development team. They're not mine. They're developers' estimates. Um, in this case, bye-bye, Acha. Uh, what, what happens here? The team just needs to focus on meeting what was promised. Meeting the budget, meeting the content, meeting the schedule. And if there are any changes required along the way, uh, the development team is then the one who is thrown under the bus. It was their estimates. Hey, I had nothing to do with this. They estimated it. How to fix it? Uh, this kind of problems um, probably are from organizations who are not understanding Agile right. Um, it's probably deep inside the structures of the organization. So it might not be a simple task or easy task, something that, yeah, has a fix. 
Um, but maybe you should get a help from a seasoned agile coach. Start finding the steps towards how to improve in that organization. Next, we have the sleepy family. Uh, in the beginning of when we start developing the product, the peer comes in with the specs. Hey, here's what we're going to build. So here's going to be da-da-da, here's going to be a uh, and this is what it's going to look like. And the next time you hear from the PO is when the team starts to get a working product and then they come in and, uh, what happened here? I had this picture. This is what it was supposed to look like. And now it looks like that. What, what happened? Why, why isn't it like this? What I showed you. So apparently the feedback loop has been missing all along. The learning loop has been missing all along. Uh, the product that you get out of it, well, it will be something. Um, how to fix it? Of course, when you have a product done, it's kind of late to fix anything. But if it's somewhat viable product that might still have chances and you continue developing it, then I suggest you do a real autopsy. You really uh, objectively look at what happened, why it happened, um, and find the root cause behind it and start fixing them one by one. Then we have the techie family. Typically when, well, not typically, but sometimes when there's a very technical person, a, a former developer who becomes the PO, they start uh, finding not only the problems for the customers, but also the how part. So how do you solve it? So when it's time for a backlog refinement, they come with the ready-made plan. Hey, this is the plan now. Hey, I have made the specs here. And here we need the MySQL database. And Mick, you have been doing this before, so maybe you could do it. And so they have the plan. Um, and if everybody respects that, it means that the developers have zero power on their work. It's not, again, very motivating for the one, for the people. Um, and the product, it's not going to be the best possible one because it is the ideas of one person only instead of the whole team. Uh, working together, making it even better product, product. In here, I would go for intervention. So I'm sure the developers will start complaining quite quickly that they can't, they're just a machine uh, working on features and, and nothing else. Uh, some coaching, mentoring might help here uh, with the PO. Uh, remembering that the peers should bring the problems and the developers should bring the how part into it. Um, sometimes it might need that somebody from the outside is bringing the message. And then we have the other end of the spectrum. We have the blah, 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 I'm not listening to anybody, don't take techie things, no techie things for me. Um, they are like, I'm responsible. I have been talking to the customer and I have promised this schedule to them. And don't disturb me with any technical details. I'm going, I'm doing this for the customer. So this business features is the ones that we really need. So um, with this, because there's a fixed schedule for the customer, uh, where we need the certain business features, it might be that it leads to pressure, time pressure for the team, which means that they can't really do proper job, but they have to do quick and dirty solutions to make the schedules happen, which means that the technical debt will just grow like a weed. There's no time to fix anything like that because we have the schedule. We, it's a whole terrible pressure to get things done. Um, so yes, you probably get a product, it, it will probably work, but it doesn't really have a proper life cycle. You can't maintain a product like that, full of technical uh, depth. How to fix it? Again, <laughs> intervention is my word here. So somebody needs to uh, coach, um, 
coach this PO into understanding what does it mean when we're building the product? And if they, there's some conflict between the architect or, or tech lead and the PO, maybe the PO doesn't feel like the uh, techies are just speaking some un understandable language. So maybe there is a mediator there who can facilitate the discussions, making sure that both sides are heard. And last family is the daydreamer family, the artistic family, who likes to decorate a lot, a little bit here and there. So they tend to get stuck with details. Uh, if this button should be here or one millimeter here. They usually get a lot of very, very nice and, and extremely polished details which have no value to nobody. Um, if it's going to be a product, it's going to be a very expensive product. So what I suggest as a fix here is again some coaching, mentoring. What does value mean? How do you deliver value? How do you measure value? How do you actually make 80% of the value with 20% of the features? So, I've given you some bad examples how POs can be, and th those were real life uh, stories. But how do you then ensure that PO does stay on track? Well, first of all, I'd start with the training, ensuring that your POs understand their roles and responsibilities. We have quite nice trainings for that as well. And uh, learn to recognize the signs of danger. I've give you, given you a lot of hints in these families, um, which I presented you. And how do you do that? You participate. Uh, you go there when, when stakeholders are asked to come and, and see what's in the backlog and prioritize. You go for the demos, you see how the product is coming along. Uh, you listen, you see how the team works, if the product will look as it should, and help the PO. It's not supposed to be a um, lonely rider riding to the sunset, but it's supposed to be a quite collaborative role. So help them do it. Help them understand the business priorities, help them understand the customer needs, uh, whatever you can do. Also, inside the team, um, uh, the Scrum Master should um, facilitate the team so that it, it's easy to speak openly and honestly about things and really improving um, everything that we do uh, in, in every role. So open and open, honest discussion, at least on the team retrospective, would be a good thing to have. And sometimes an own coach can help you find the right tools, uh, which would be the best ones in this environment to uh, describe and visualize the future of the product and, and prioritize the work as well. So in the toolbox, we have a lot of things to, to help on PO stay on track. The training, the coaching and mentoring, which are a bit different things. So in coaching, uh, we try to get the people to uh, find the solutions and in mentoring we're more giving the solutions sometimes working together being a sparring partner there uh, talking about why should we prioritize this over this and have you thought of this angle um, and like that sometimes just showing an example so showing how a PO would handle um, certain things but uh, sometimes um POs are just somebody who knows the area the best but are not really fit to the PO. So sometimes, despite all the best intention, you might end up with the Petka car. Um, we used to play the Hulun Kuriset Perheat, the happy families here in Finland with these Petka cards. At least in my childhood, we played, played with that. And Pekka was the solo one. He didn't have any family. And if you were left with Pekka card in your hand at the end of the game, you lost it. So sometimes um, you need to think about if, if this person is really fit for the PO or, or are they 
or just a really good subject matter expert and that's how they work as the best so i've given you a lot of bad cards here today i hope you have the winning cards in your deck so um in your com in the comment section which i will look shortly hopefully you will also tell me what kind of cards do you have but thank you. Uh, that was my speak. And um, here are my contact details if you wish to contact me. And I'm happy to connect in LinkedIn West as well. So why not send me a connect request? And uh, did we have questions? Thank you, Raya. Yeah, thank you for that very cool talk. I really love the, the kind of way you categorize those product owner anti patterns. I recognize many myself, but I now I've got names for them. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, I've got a question. Don't forget, everyone, if you want to ask questions, uh, the chat window, which is on your right, I believe it's on my right, uh, there's a little chat window there. Please type your questions in there as they come to you throughout the speakers' talks, and we will we'll put them to the end. Uh, there's one in, well, a kind of two part question in the chat for you, Raya. I'll read them, I'll go half and half. Uh, okay. Kind of how to get people to be self-organized uh, when they're used to being in a command and control environment. I guess this is probably pertinent to product owners, really. How do you get them to be more self-organized and more uh, have more accountability, I guess, is the question, when they're normally told what to do? Yeah, uh, I think it depends a lot on the organization. Some organizations just can't support it that well. So you have to be really brave to take the, the actions on your own hands. But um, um, there's, there's, of course, many things that you can do even if you don't have the support. So you can, you can still uh, be active, be proactive, proposing things, talk to the organization. Uh, explain them things and as long as you understand your own role and what you should be doing it should be quite easy for you to to explain uh, why you're building product like this and why you why you are the one in the oh yeah so what is that in English <laughs> why you need to have the leash <laughs> yeah absolutely thank you very much um, and the other half of the question is um, what about if if um, people have like you know uh, lots of tasks that come in out that kind of come in out of scope? We're all used to that, right? We have a mission. We're quite quite clear on what we're trying to do, but while we're trying to do it, we get many other tasks creeping in to our workload. You know those those last minute incidents and out of scope tasks. Uh, what would you be as your tip there for product owners in that sense? Um, there's always going to be surprises. So just ensure that when the team does their planning, they leave room for surprises. And especially if you're doing IT stuff, it's full of surprises. So, so uh, be prepared to unknown issues and also those unknown, unknown, unknown issues. So don't load your sprints full. Uh, leave, room, leave, room, leave room also for this kind of uh, taking out the technical depth uh, making the refactoring, uh, mm. you need to really remember you're building a product that has to be alive for 10 so I don't know how long, uh, but years typically at least. So it's something that you really need to also technically take really good care of the product. Uh, so leave room for that. So don't fill your back, uh, your sprint backlogs to capacity, some capacity for the unknown is what you're saying that might yes. come along. Yeah, fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Got a question in from Maria now. Um, do you think a person with no technical background could succeed as a product owner? Definitely. <laughs> Easy answer. Yes. Uh, it does help if you have the technical background. So then you have the chance to understand what are the capabilities of the product? What, what can you build? But uh, you have the development team to support you. Just work closely with your development team with your uh, tech lead, with your architect, uh, they will help you. And a good subject matter expert can really be a really good PO as well. Fantastic. Do you find um, that a lot of organizations, a question for me, a lot of organizations are going from like a transformation from old ways of working into agile ways of working. 
And um, when you look for who is going to fulfill now this role of product owner, right? We typically then go to those product managers or or maybe even project managers. Would you say it's more of a behavioral skill set you're looking for or a, a, a more technical skill set? Is it a type of person you're looking for rather than what they've done in the past? Um, yeah, I think it's more about the type of person because yeah. you need to have like uh, really good communication skills. You need to be able to make decisions like this. You need to be able to say no to the CEO when they suggest something stupid. So it takes a lot of courage. It, it takes a lot of um, negotiation. You need to also be able to see the big picture. You need to understand a lot of things. So it's more about the, the person, really. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Any more questions? Uh, pop them into chat. I'm, I'm thinking if we do get questions uh, that come into us after this uh, session, we'll we'll get them onto Raya, and uh, hopefully you can you can uh, answer them offline as well. Don't forget you can connect with Raya there on LinkedIn. That that connection is still on the screen there. I think you're giving a lot of people some hope. It looks like in the chat here, Raya. It's a really good uh, subject matter and something that connects with many many people. Okay, there's no more questions in chat. So it is, uh, thank you very much, Raya. Let's give a big round of applause to Raya for our talk there on product ownership and the product owner happy families. Uh, our next talk is in around eight minutes time. We've got Erica Vitekanen. So uh, that gives you everyone eight minutes to, uh, to refresh your cups and uh, join us back in eight minutes time for the next session. But that for now, Raya, thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. See you all soon.